Hello, Dr. Kevin Ashley. How are you? Sorry, I think you're muted. Yes, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good. I'll be your All moderator right. for your presentation. We'll start at four o'clock. Okay, shall we try sharing the screen? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I think you're muted. Yes. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Uh, Flora, um, actually, I just sent, sent a oh, link yeah. in the chat. Uh, it's right now online already. So Shall you can share with this? everybody right now. It's live streaming, it's working. Okay. That's great. Thank you for telling me. And is the streaming working? Yes, it is working right now. Good. Yeah, it's working. Good. Uh, it's right now. Our next speaker will be Dr. Kevin Ashley. Professor Ashley is an expert in computer modeling of legal reasoning and cyberspace legal issues at the University of Pittsburgh graduate program in intelligence systems. He got his JD from Harvard Law School and PhD in computer science from the University of Massachusetts. Professor Ashley is recognized for significant contributions to artificial intelligence in law. Honored is a fellow of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence. He is a former National Science Foundation Presidential Yawn Investigator and a former president of the International Association of Artificial Intelligence and Law. His research is widely published and supported by National Science Foundation grants. Additionally, Dr. Ashley authored influential books and held leadership roles in Ecomedia. Beyond his position at the School of Law, Professor Ashley is a senior scientist at the Learning Research and Development Center, an adjunct professor of computer science. He will talk about AI and legal analytics. Professor Ashley, please take it over. Thank you, Flora. It's a pleasure to participate in these conversations on AI technologies and their implications. And thank you, Professor Wang, for inviting me. My field of AI and law is a sub, a sub area of artificial intelligence where researchers build computational models of legal reasoning behaviors. Today, I would like to tell you a story about how quickly technology is changing in the field of AI and law. But first, let me introduce these two areas in which I work. Case-based legal argument involves supporting legal inferences with arguments that compare a problem scenario with relevant legal cases. I have built computer programs that model this kind of analogical reasoning from precedents. More recently, I work in legal text analytics. It employs machine learning, natural language processing, and other computational techniques automatically to classify legal concepts or to predict outcomes in archives of legal texts, such as case decisions, contracts, or statutes. Here is a timeline of AI models of case-based legal reasoning since about 2017. I want to show you just how much has changed in the last seven years. We will start with number one, a particular knowledge-based model of case-based legal argument, and then move through text analytic approaches that apply machine learning, two, to case texts to predict outcomes, number three, to classify issues and factors, and number four, to explain the predicted outcomes in terms of these issues and factors. 
And finally, number five, using generative AI to identify case factors automatically. So don't be frightened by this complex picture. In this first project, number one, my student, Matthias Gropmeyer's VJAP program used a knowledge-based model of case-based argument. VJAP stands for Value Judgment-Based Argumentative Prediction. One inputs a new case to VJAP up at the left, a current fact situation, or CFF, CFS for short, represented as a set of factors. Factors are a kind of legal knowledge. They are stereotypical fact patterns that strengthen or weaken a side's legal argument in a particular domain. VJAP uses argument schemes to analyze the case at bar based on relevant cases and precedents, and then ranks them in an argument graph in terms of its confidence in the argument's outcomes. It then predicts an outcome for the input case based on the highest confidence arguments it could produce, and it explains its prediction in terms of the arguments. You can see an example of the kinds of arguments it generated in the middle of the screen. It draws analogical mappings from a target case to the most relevant precedents, where the analogies are drawn in terms of shared factors and the effects of a decision on the underlying values. The main point is that its arguments employed legal knowledge, namely issues from the relevant legal rules, factors, and values underlying the legal rules and issues, highlighted in red in that argument. And in an evaluation, VJAP's highest predictive accuracy tied that of a machine learning model but the machine learning model could not explain its predictions, whereas VJAP could. Now, VJAP is complex. And for this talk, I simply want to emphasize that it contained a lot of legal knowledge. Its domain model included a set of logical rules governing the claims for trade misappropriation and identifying the issues these rules, which are represented by the rule tree in the center top of the screen, are based on the relevant statutes and sources on the left. It, can, it included trade secret cases represented in the center at the bottom, indexed by the issues and factors in green, and linked to underlying values at the upper right. And it also included argument schemes for making and responding to case-based arguments using the rules, cases, factors, and values in the domain. Here's a more abstract view of a knowledge-based computational model of arguing with cases. As mentioned, the models employ argument schemes to represent patterns of legal argumentation. The schemes are like templates or blueprints for typical kinds of legal arguments. The schemes include, for example, arguing deductively from legal rules, or arguing by analogy to past cases, or other schemes that address responding to such arguments by distinguishing a precedent or citing a counterexample. Again, when inputs a current fact situation, the argument schemes guide a search for a supporting argument or counterargument that's added to an argument graph, and the process continues until there are no more arguments to add. And then the model evaluates the argument using legal proof standards. So where is the legal knowledge? It relies, it resides in the argument schemes, the legal proof standards, and in the legal reasoning domain model that I illustrated in the previous slide. Here's the thing. These knowledge-based approaches, including VJAP, depended on manually representing the legal knowledge. Someone had to read the cases to represent the legal knowledge in a way that a computer could process. 
Just two years later, however, the field moved dramatically away from these knowledge-based models to text analytic models based not on knowledge representation, but on statistical machine learning using a deep learning neural network. A picture may help to convey an intuition about deep learning neural networks trained on large databases of texts. The neural networks comprise input-output nodes connected to multiple layers of intermediary nodes via weighted edges. The inputs propagate through the nodes from the left to the right in this picture to an output. The goal is to learn weights that minimize the difference between the computed output and the target output. Deep learning neural networks employ multiple layers, and the hidden layers in the middle learn features with predictive weight. Here's the problem. Neural networks learn weights to make predictions about what about word completions and even about outcomes of legal cases, but they do not necessarily yield accessible explanations. Why is that? It's because the knowledge, such as it is, resides in the weights distributed across the network. And it's difficult to tease that knowledge out of the network with which to fashion an explanation. In addition, the weights do not necessarily correspond to the kinds of knowledge that lawyers and judges think is relevant. Indeed, the relevant knowledge for making an explanation may not even be in the network. The second point in my progression is a good example of this. Chalkidis' approach applied machine learning to case texts to predict the outcomes of the cases. Working directly from textual descriptions of a case's facts, Chalkidis' neural networks predicted if the European Court of Human Rights, a, a, a court, found a violation of any provisions of the European Convention on Human Rights, that's a law, and of which provisions. Chalkidis' team trained and developed the networks with nearly 8,500 cases and tested it on 3,000 3, cases. By contrast, the VJAP program that we saw before had only 121 cases. In terms of F1 scores, a metric that means the weighted average of precision and recall, their model predicted whether there was a violation with an F1 of 82%, and it predicted which prov provisions were violated with an F1 of 60%. And those results were impressive. But Chalkidis's work illustrated a limitation of legal text analytics. It could not explain its predictions in terms that legal professionals would understand. There are no legal rules, no factors, no values in this text analytic approach, nothing with which to construct an argument or explanation that a lawyer would understand. What their machine learning program could do is to highlight portions of text that influenced its prediction. And for this purpose, it employed hierarchical attention networks, HANs. An HAN predicts case outcomes and yields attention weights. The figure at the left shows an HAN that computes attention weights for words and then for sentences. HANs assign higher attention scores to the portions of text that have greater influence, greater weight on the model's outcome prediction. This led to a plausible idea. Could one use HAN highlighting to explain predictions and answers? Based on the HAN's weightings, an interface highlights the more predictive aspects of the text 
as illustrated on the right of the screen. The model attends more highly to the words colored in various shades of pink and red, and to the sentences indicated with the vertical heat bars on the left. The subject matter here is Article 3 of the Human Rights Convention, which prohibits torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The highlighted portions seem more or less relevant, but do they amount to an explanation? Carl Branting's experiments suggest that such highlighted, high-scoring portions of case texts do not amount to meaningful legal explanations. He engaged legal experts and non-experts on a task involving analyzing decisions of domain name disputes under the rules of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. The user interface employed attention weight-based highlighting. In his experiment, each participant was asked to decide the issue of, quote, no rights or legitimate interests, NRLI, in two separate cases, and to provide a justification for each prediction. No rights or legitimate interests is an important issue in WIPO domain name disputes. The participants saw highlighted case texts like the one on the screen. The highlighting seemed neither to help nor hurt the accuracy of the participants' decisions. However, Branting observed that the participants had difficulty understanding the connection between the highlighted text and the legal issue that they were supposed to decide. Now, although one experiment is not determinative, this finding was a blow to hopes that these HAN attention weights can explain legal predictions. Branting recommended that useful decision support should help the user to understand the connection between relevant portions of the case record and the issues and reasoning of the case. Now, legal knowledge would presumably be important in helping users to understand this connection, but the question is, how can one integrate legal knowledge into this text analytic process? That leads to the third point of the progression, a promising research project described in Carl Branting's 2020 paper in the AI and Law Journal, Scalable and Explainable Legal Predictions. Branting's SCALE project applied machine learning to predict case outcomes and to identify issues and factors in the case texts, both of which could be useful for explaining predictions. The authors developed a semi-supervised approach called SCALE for annotating WIPO domain name dispute cases in terms of factual and legal findings. Text annotation involves making, marking up texts of case decisions to identify instances of semantic types of information. The types are the concepts of interest in the texts. Here, for example, legal issues and case holdings. The types of interest are organized into a type system like the one that you see on the screen. It's a hierarchy of concepts and relations that can be used by a machine learning program to automatically assign the labels to new texts. The researchers annotated sentences from the findings sections of a small set of decisions in terms of the labels in the type system. For example, see the issue of no rights or legitimate interests, NRLI, and its related factor of prior biz use, prior business use, both highlighted in green. As I mentioned, no rights or legitimate interests is important. It comes from one of the WIPO rules governing domain name disputes. The rule states the importance of a bona fide business use of the domain name prior to notice of the dispute. Here are samples of annotated text excerpts 
from the factual and legal findings sections of two domain name dispute cases. Human annotators assigned the labels shown in the last column under the red arrow. These labels come from the scale type system that we saw in the previous slide. The researchers then used their labeled data so that the model could label the sentences in the findings sections of all the cases in the WIPO corpus using machine learning. And they confirmed that the projected label annotations predicted case outcomes with reasonably high F1 scores. And as a bonus, the tags represented substantive conceptual features, legal features that could be used to help, the predict, to help explain the predictions. For example, the text to the right of the blue arrow says the respondent clearly is not making any non-commercial or fair use of those domain names. That text in a case might end up being highlighted as having weight, but now that text will be associated with an annotation to the left of the green arrow that relates it to the issue of no rights or legitimate interests as a legal finding. With that kind of labeling, the highlighted portion of text could then help human users to make that connection to the legal task that they were meant to perform. Scale's predictions were accurate, but the scale program stopped short of actually making those explanations. And in addition, as Branting pointed out, WIPO cases have a high degree of stylistic consistency in the language used in the finding sections. It was an empirical issue how well these techniques would apply to legal domains with more complex and varied scenarios. And that brings us to the fourth project on the timeline, applying machine learning to case texts to predict outcomes by classifying issues and factors and explaining the predicted outcomes in terms of the issues and factors. This work, number four, is the work of my current student, Morgan Gray, in a project that we call the Diaz Project. His program learns to identify factors in case texts, to use the factors in predicting case outcomes, and to explain those predictions. We are working with drug interdiction automo automobile stop cases, Diaz cases for short. In the United States, police officers regularly stop motorists for minor traffic violations and end up searching the car for drugs. The legality of the search depends on whether the officer's suspicion was reasonable. If not, the evidence resulting from the search can be suppressed. We identified a set of substantive factors that courts use in determining if a police officer has reasonable suspicion that an automobile contains illicit drugs. These factors of suspicion are listed at the left. They have to do with the appearance or behavior of the occupant of the vehicle, the occupant's status and travel plans, and the status of the vehicle. Law students manually annotated the sentences in 211 Diaz cases in terms of factors of suspicion. Morgan then trained a supervised machine learning model to automatically annotate sentences by factors. Table three on the left shows the results of his test. Where there were 10 or more sentences to train from, the F1 scores ranged from 70 to 92%, which is good performance. In a second experiment, we tested how well machine learning models could predict and explain case outcomes based on the identified factors of suspicion. We applied the machine learning models shown in table four at the right to predict the outcomes of the cases in the test set and where possible to identify the most important factors for the prediction. All of the models tested outperformed the two baseline models and they achieved 97% accuracy. Some of them achieved 97% accuracy. So these results show that at least with our 211 cases, 
the factors of suspicion in our list can accurately predict the outcome of suspicion. Now let's look a little more closely at the decision tree model underlined in green. The decision tree model shows which of the factors can be used to predict the case outcomes most efficiently. At the root node, the model asks whether factor 4n is present in the input case. This factor, unusual vehicle ownership, has to do with whether the car is rented or otherwise owned by a third party. If 4n is present, the left branch is followed and we reach a terminal node. The model then predicts that reasonable suspicion is found with the probability of 0.78. If 4n is not present, the right branch is followed, and the process repeats with a new factor, 1d, suspicious or inconsistent answers. We found that with just four factors of suspicion, the model can explain all of the case outcomes with 80% accuracy. This kind of analysis raises interesting policy questions. Millions of people rent automobiles, should renting an automobile be that important from a normative viewpoint, especially given the risks associated with auto stops? Well, so far we're only dealing with 211 cases, but with the ability to apply text analytics to identify factors automatically, we can eventually process many more cases and strengthen our conclusions about this legal domain. Now let's turn to generative AI the most effective text analytic method to date. It involves deep learning neural network models that can be trained on vast amounts of data and then can generate new examples from scratch using patterns in that data. And if you've used ChatGPT, you're familiar with generative AI. For these generative models, the user inputs prompts to the system the prompts control the system's outputs, and it turns out that well-defined prompts are the recipe for a successful conversation that covers the topics of interest with generative models like GPT-4. The generative models may support zero-shot, one-shot, or few-shot learning. These indicate if a prompt provides no no examples, one example, or two or more examples of a targeted response. And with that, we come to the fifth project of the timeline. Morgan Gray has applied generative AI, that is GPT 4.0, to identify factors in case texts automatically. Gray employed few shot learning with prompts like the one on the left to label factors in Diaz cases the prompts, it turns out, are based on the exact same instructions that we provided to the human annotators when they performed manual annotation. And GPT-4 can follow those instructions and do a very good job, as illustrated in the results in the tables on the right. We have seen some ways that legal knowledge for case-based argument can be represented when using text analytic approaches. As you can see from the progression, a lot has changed in just seven or so years. Where is this progression leading us, especially in an age of generative AI? I suggest that the answer may be argument scheme-based prompting. Let's call it the sixth point on that progression. As we have seen, one needs to prompt GPT-4 to predict a label or to answer a question. But today we are seeing examples of structured prompts in the legal domain. Some of these prompts are shown here, a prompt to lead GPT to reason through a legal syllogism, a prompt to assess whether a hypothesis is legally entailed in a situation, and a prompt to rate the best case-based explanation of a statutory term. Structured prompts like these look increasingly like argument schemes. You remember, the argument schemes are templates or blueprints for typical kinds of legal arguments. I think that argument schemes 
and domain models like those in VJAP, SCALE, and the Diaz project could provide the concepts to use in prompting and guide the structure of the prompts. And right now we're experimenting with generating prompts for generative AI to perform case-based argument tasks, such as drawing legally relevant analogies across cases and then responding to those arguments by distinguishing them. We've generated some promising results, but we have quite a bit more work to do. And let me end with these uh, takeaways uh, and I'll skip to the bottom one I think that argument schemes and domain models like those in the VJAP, SCALE, and Diaz projects could inform argument scheme-based prompts to strong LLMs to generate case-based legal arguments, providing a pathway for integrating legal knowledge into generative AI. And I'm happy to take questions whenever it's possible. Professor Ashley. Thank you for your amazing presentation. And I have a question. So do you, all of your students know how to code? I have two kinds of students. I have uh, PhD students uh, in the Intelligent Systems Program, and uh, they definitely do know how to code. But I have law students as well, and many of them do not know how to code. And the wonderful thing about generative AI is they don't need to know how to code in order to do some really uh, interesting work uh, with some very uh, simple uh, kinds of, of coding using uh, tools that are uh, readily available. Uh, they could analyze case texts, they could uh, answer questions based on the text, they can uh, investigate issues with respect to contracts and statutes. Um, it really is changing uh, the, uh, the necessity for, un for being able to code. One has to still think systematically, but one doesn't need to put those systematic thoughts into code in order to get a result. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, Matthew Allen's AI art won first prize at the Colorado State Fair, but the US government has ruled it cannot be copyrighted because it has too much machine and not enough like human. An award-winning piece of AI art cannot be copyrighted. The US Copyright Office is ruled. Would you please kindly comment on the copyright on AI art? Uh, that's uh, an interesting uh, question that uh, I don't have a lot uh, to say. Um, the um, uh, Copyright Act and also the, the Patent Act require, uh, as far as I know, human authors. And if a program is the author of the uh, artwork or of a patent, that's going to be a problem in the United States uh, it isn't a problem in other jurisdictions. What I'm worried about with respect to generative AI is another kind of copyright issue. And that is uh, that the uh, generative AI programs are trained on enormous quantities of text. And those texts come from magazines, newspapers, from the web, from Wikipedia, and all sorts of places. And many of those texts are copyrighted. And so one question is, does that process of training the generative AI system generate copies of copyrighted works, which would be copyright infringement unless it's protected as a fair, fair use? And I think that's one of the big legal issues that, we'll be see, that we will see in the big New York Times case versus OpenAI. Okay. Our next question is, when you talked about knowledge-based, do you mean knowledge graph? Uh, knowledge graph is one way of representing uh, the knowledge. Uh, I have not seen it used in the legal domain, however, but uh, what I'm talking about are uh, creating structures like uh, factors, um, uh, uh, structures for representing uh, the logic of statutes. Uh, so what I'm, I'm 
uh, referring to those sorts of uh, uh, knowledge representation techniques. Okay, thank you. Our last question is, will law be taken over by AI? I don't think so. Um, I know that uh, as soon as these tools become available and uh, companies try to sell, uh, do sell them to, to law firms, uh, there's uh, immediately a lot of commercial hype associated with them, and um, law students uh, start to wonder whether there will be jobs when they finally graduate. Um, but uh, I, I do think they're going to change the way we practice law, and that means we have to change the way we educate law students so that they become familiar with these tools and they understand what the tools can do and what they can't do. They understand how to evaluate the tools. But if they're trained in that kind of information, they should have plenty of job opportunities available to them. So I don't think it's going to eliminate jobs, but I do think it's going to change uh, legal practice and how we need to teach law students. Okay. Thank you again for your wonderful presentation. And that's the end of our Q&A part. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nick Nugent, a professor at law school at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He will talk about law and AI. Professor Nugent, please take it over. Hello, uh, let me share my screen here real quick. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, well, um, I wish I had uh, been able to join earlier for Professor Ashley's uh, presentation. Uh, it looked fascinating, the part that I saw. And uh, he started to touch upon some of the topics that I'll cover. So um, that's a good lead in. Um, what I'm going to do is provide a sort of survey of a smorgasbord of AI issues in the law. Basically, where is AI changing traditional or historic ways in which the law has functioned. And this really is a survey, so I, I won't be able to get too in-depth into any one of these, but we'll just go for these and uh, feel free to interrupt with questions, of course. So uh, first area in which AI is challenging or stretching traditional legal doctrines is in the area of tort liability. Tort, of course, referring to uh, aspects of, of injury, of personal injury, uh, and other dignitary harms, for example, uh, defamation. Well, one area in which AI challenges the way tort laws traditionally functioned is with respect to the attribution of liability. Traditional tort liability often hinges on notions of negligence and intent or strict liability, but AI is unpredictable. It is aleatoric. It is designed to be so. It's not merely a, a bug. It is a feature. One of the things that makes it generative is the use of random number generators inside, such that when I prompt it for a particular image and uh, Professor Ashley prompts it for something, using the exact same prompt, we will get different results. Uh, that's to make it appear more human, more creative, uh, in addition to other aspects that make it uh, less predictable. So when it comes to AI systems, that's going to introduce some challenges. Who is the responsible party if an injury should emerge from an AI system? Is it the developer, the user of the system? Perhaps it's the owner of an AI system or even the AI itself. These are problems that we're still trying to solve. Likewise, tort law depends a great deal on the issue of predictability or foreseeability. Uh, a harm may result from my actions, but if it was not foreseeable that by doing some small act to set off a chain of 13 causal uh, events that, that result in someone's injury, well, then my that injury might not have been for reasonably foreseeable by my action. And again, because AI is unpredictable, it's going to challenge how we assess foreseeability. Moreover, AI is capable of learning. And so what might be foreseeable in one moment is not necessarily foreseeable in another moment if AI has acquired new capabilities. Uh, similarly, 
Tort law traditionally recognizes the distinction between product liability versus service liability. Uh, and these are gross oversimplifications as with all of this stuff, but service liability typically requires proving that the service provider failed to meet a standard of care. Uh, in addition, um, services can be, uh, I should say, liability for services can often be disclaimed. For example, when you use an online service or you use software, the uh, proprietor often disclaims any reps or warranties from it. It may work well, it might not. Uh, your only remedy is maybe a refund or a service level guarantee if it doesn't work, but we disclaim all other reps and warranties. Whereas product liability, if you buy a manufactured good, uh, manufacturers, distributors, suppliers, they can be liable for injuries caused by those products that they put into commerce. They can be subject to strict liability um, and they have less freedom to disclaim or waive liability. So is an AI system a product or a service or what standard should we use? if it causes physical harm. Intellectual property, as Professor Ashley uh, started to get into, is proving a very tricky ground with respect to AI. He mentioned the New York Times v. OpenAI lawsuit, where the New York Times is claiming that OpenAI has slurped up uh, over 100 years of, I guess it's over 100 years, of content from the New York Times and used it to train its model. That's how these LLMs work, as we all know, they ingest huge amounts of material, and then they use that to train models from which they engage in large-scale pattern recognition and generation. Much of that content, not just by the New York Times, but other companies, is bound to be copyrighted. Now, the copyright law in the United States provides an exclusive right of reproduction. No one can reproduce my, that is, make a copy of my copyrighted work unless I give a license. There are exceptions. There are uh, affirmative defenses such as fair use, but uh, it is concerning that uh, these lar these LLMs and these AI companies are slurping up vast amounts of copyrighted data without permission. Now, they don't really care about the inputs themselves, these companies, I think, who are complaining about it, like the New York Times, what they really care about, although that is a distinct legal issue, is they care about the outputs. There are occasions where a AI system, now they claim that once they train their model using certain copyrighted content, then that's the end of the story. They discard the content. They don't keep it around. They don't keep a permanent copy. That's why they claim we're not, we're not engaging in the uh, infringing the reproduction right. We're just training it and moving on. It's fair use. There are occasions though where the models will inadvertently memorize or regurgitate whole passages from New York Times or other copyrighted sources. Uh, that's obviously an issue, but the more common and perhaps more concerning issue is the fact that AI can summarize. Now, one important limitation in copyright law is that of fair use. I can reproduce your work. I can publicly distribute your work. I can publicly perform your work if doing so uh, is transformative. For example, parody. If, for example, it's commentary or news reporting or the like, or if I'm simply summarizing your content, if I'm not, if I, I can produce a, a summary of your book, as long as I'm not copying the content verbatim, of course, there are nuances there. But the problem is that a great deal of valuable content on the internet is now being summarized by AI. So one of the things that the New York Times complained about was that it has this one site or this one portal called Wirecutter, where it provides recommendations, you know, which, what's the best office chair? And they hire people and they pay a lot of money to buy uh, these various chairs, test them out and make recommendations. Well, if OpenAI ingests this and someone says, hey, what's a, a good recommendation for an office chair? OpenAI can summarize it. Well, according to Wirecutter, these are the best chairs. That's not a copyright violation. It's a theft of work, of sweat, but that's not, that's not uh, against the law. That's not a tort violation. And so fair use makes a lot of sense when I'm asking uh, you know, my neighbor to summarize a book he read, but when it comes to the scale of ingestion and explanation and summarization that AI systems can engage in, this threatens to do something that a number of people are complaining about, namely to turn the internet into plumbing, right? What's the difference between an, an AI system like ChatGPT and a search engine? Well, the difference is when I search for best office chairs by Google, Google has indeed ingested all that content, just like OpenAI. 
but it is used to create an index, a search index that provi provides a list of links. When I click on the link, I go to the site. Websites love Google. They, they want to be as high on Google's search results as possible. They, they pay money for it. They fight over it because it drives traffic to their site where they can monetize the traffic, where they can sell advertisements, where they can sell products. But if I can just say, what are the best office chairs? And it gives me a nice tidy summary. And I can say, well, trim that down a bit or add some more. And I can, I can tweak it all I want. And ChatGPT obediently does it. Well, then I never need to visit the sites that provided the information that went into ChatGPT in the first place. I'm going to stay within the walled garden of ChatGPT and all the people who worked to create the content that ChatGPT created, they're just plumbing and they don't get those eyeballs. They don't get that traffic. And that's a, that's a grave uh, concern. Uh, the question was asked about copyrightability. And there, uh, this was this was mentioned, so I'll just go very quickly through this. There was indeed, Jason Allen won the Colorado Art Fair with a AI generated image. He then tried to copyright it and the copyright office said, no dice, you can't because copyright requires a human author. He said, but look, look what I did. See the image on the right, I upscaled it a bit. I added some texturing, um, I enhanced it a bit. And they said, great, image on the right, you can get a copyright over your additions, your contributions to the image, but the underlying image, no dice. Anybody can have that. Copyright requires a human author. Uh, similarly, in a case uh, about a year and a half ago, Thaler v. Vidal, a inventor submitted uh, various uh, patent applications to the patent office for AI-generated inventions. The computer did all the work. He listed the computer as the inventor, and they said, nope, a human inventor is required. And this has policy implications because if the purpose of the Patent Act and any of the Copyright Act, the IP system, is to encourage more innovation, are we discouraging innovation by requiring a, a human author. Um, name, image, and likeness. You may have seen the, the news about uh, Taylor Swift and deep fake porn videos created of her. Likewise, there was a, a catchy video of Drake and The Weeknd uh, in singing a song and doing a dance. Only problem was that they never they did no such thing. This was an AI-generated song that was trained on their material and made to sound like them. Now, it's lawful to copy someone else's style, but AI takes it to another level. Why buy a new Taylor Swift album when AI can just generate one for you? With her voice, even. And so, apropos, just yesterday, Tennessee became the first state in the nation to pass a law that specifically protects your voice. So if I record several songs and someone else uses AI to generate songs that use my voice, that's going to be a tort under Tennessee law. Of course, it's not tremendously well drafted, but it's good to see that Tennessee is moving in this direction and other states are moving to outlaw uh, deep fake porn. Information integrity. Now, the old school information integrity problems were phishing emails where the grammatical mistakes were so laughably bad that you knew you were dealing with someone who was a con artist. Well, that's the old school. The new school are images like this. Now, I'm not saying this was intended for fraud. Actually, I don't think that was at all. This is an image of Palestinian children in Gaza uh, as a result of the uh, invasion by the Israeli Defense Forces. This image is fake. This never happened, at least this particular image, that is. Yet this generated a fair amount of news and sympathy, uh, st threatening to very much poison the news environment with fake images on both sides of the equation. Also, deep fakes are proving to be a very effective tactic in fraud, particularly ex uh, sextortion. Um, there's a uh, great video on YouTube you can find of a lawyer who was duped, almost duped, into wiring uh, a great deal of money because he thought his son had been arrested for drunk driving. And it was his son's voice that called him on the phone, but it was a deep fake of his son's voice. AI is even getting to the point now where it can mimic your handwriting, which brings up all sorts of fun issues related to checks and authenticity. What are the consequences? of these information integrity problems. Well, obviously the fraud issues that I just addressed, but 
Broader than that, electoral mischief. There is a story of fake Joe Biden robocalls telling New Hampshire Democrats not to vote on Tuesday. Joe Biden said no such thing. It was a fake. This is uh, going to be the next frontier, unfortunately, of, inf of electoral integrity issues in the United States and elsewhere, I'm sure. Um, there's also the problem of proof now in criminal trials. So in the United States, one cannot be convicted of a crime uh, absent proof beyond reasonable doubt. Well, now you have defendants saying, oh, that what otherwise would have been smoking gun recording of me, that smoking gun recording of my voice or video of me breaking into the house. That's not real. That's a fake. It's a deep fake. Now, that might be true. It might not be true. If it's not true, then Suddenly, criminals have a new tool in their defense, and it's called the liar's dividend, as my uh, my friend Danielle Citrin calls it. Anybody can now deny something that actually happened by saying, oh, it's just, it's just a deep fake. So how might we solve some of these information integrity problems? Well, uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, laws being proposed to outlay, outlaw deep fake porn. The FCC has banned AI faked robocalls. And there have been proposals to, these are private sector solutions now, but to watermark content, which can be helpful, but watermarks can be removed. In fact, what might end up happening is that we don't have watermarks on AI generated content, but we have uh, digital signatures, cryptographic hashes, watermarks on authentic images to indicate that they're not deep faked. And so the only way to trust that something is authentic is if it has the uh, authenticity watermark. I can see that I'm not getting through my slides nearly fast enough, despite talking very fast. So just keep going. Fourth Amendment provides freedom against unreasonable searches and seizures and the guarantee that warrants may not issue absent probable cause. There are important limitations as to these privacy rights. You have to have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Likewise, if you convey information to a third party, and there are exceptions to this, then that information is you do not have a reasonable expectation of that privacy. So if I give a incriminating evidence to Ping, and then she turns it in voluntarily over to the police, that's not a violation. Now, or even if the police just ask her for it, and she turns it over. Um, now, the problem is that, okay, we've, we've known that we've just Autumn, we've assumed for many years that if you do something in public, you, sh you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. You can you know, commit a crime or it's visible. You, you shouldn't have done that. Now, the problem is that um, people did surreptitious acts in public all the time. Uh, and the limitation on the government was that it could not possibly surveil everybody. That problem was remedied in part by rampant surveillance cameras, but even surveillance cameras have a limitation in that it still lacks manpower. You can record thousands of hours of people milling about all around the, the, the world, but then you have to review thousands of hours, millions of hours to find patterns, and that's still a manpower problem. AI can solve that by recognizing people across videos and identifying where they are and what they did. Just type in a SQL query, perhaps, instead of having to review footage. Privacy, or sorry, pardon me, AI can be used to identify people via their faces. And in a chilling development, China is developing tech that can identify people by virtue of their gait, by virtue of the way they walk. This allows the law and law enforcement to draw inferences one of the things I find very interesting was a 2013 fake um, report, I think by a data scientist who uh, posed as a, um, a, a loyalist, a, a faithful British subject in 1772 to investigate these pesky uprising colonialists. And he was asked to analyze, just analyze what some of these people have done and, and their connections. And analyzing who their connections are created a graph and you can't see it in here, but right in the smack dab in the middle was this guy named Paul Revere who had the highest confidence score. So merely by observing public activity and analyzing it, vast inferences of criminality can be inferred, which makes our Fourth Amendment privacy rights 
less valuable than they have historically been. AI introduces problems of bias and discrimination. For instance, the fact that facial recognition technology performs more poorly with darker skinned people. And Rite Aid was recently slapped down by the FTC and, and was banned from using facial recognition technology in its stores because it used it so poorly and accused so many uh, black and brown people of shoplifting when the tech was wildly inaccurate as to their actions. Militarization is a concern. Uh, there are handshake and um, lightweight agreements between countries such as China and the United States to not use autonomous weapons like drones. Um, sorry, uh, my computer is a little frozen here. Uh, not to use autonomous weapons like drone, uh, AI and drones and nuclear warhead. That's good, but it doesn't stop either party from continuing to develop AI powered weaponry. And there's the age old problem of international coordination. We have limited tools in the law to govern the behavior of foreign entities. Also, should AI or robots ever merit legal personhood? If they can talk, interact with us, appear almost indistinct from humans, would they merit treatment as legal persons, as even legal natural persons? Well, what criteria might we use? One reason why we might say that they merit treatment as humans, or part, pardon me, not as humans, as persons, is because they have intelligence. If they pass the Turing test, I'm guessing here everyone knows what the Turing test is. Uh, John Searle had a, a different thought experiment, the Chinese room test, where he's posited that merely being able to translate and, and uh, mimic intelligence does not mean that there's actual comprehension going on. And so can we even ever know if machines attain consciousness, if they just look indistinguishable from conscious beings? If they, we did finally decide that AI machines were conscious and deserving of personhood, what rights should they have? Do they deserve a right to liberty such as we do? And if so, does that mean we can no longer use them? Because that would be equivalent to caging them and uh, subjecting them to involuntary servitude. Do they have speech rights and freedom from compulsory thought rights under our First Amendment? If so, that would prevent us from programming them or changing their programming, just as I can't reprogram any of your minds. Well, I don't have the capacity, but the state could not under the First Amendment. We have a right of freedom of thought. Would they have a right to own property? That's a fundamental human right, but that would be pretty big deal if AI could own it because then it could accumulate capital much more efficiently than I could, and it could work all day and all night, and it could live a long time and eventually become far wealthier than any humans. Would they have a right of free association? Humans do, under, persons do, under the US Constitution. Would they have the right to grow as large as they like, to reproduce, such as we have rights to have children under Supreme Court precedent to educate themselves? Would they have a right to vote, to run for office? Well, some think, no, that's a terrible idea. Why? Because AI presents grave existential risks. This was a survey of 70 some experts in AI and machine learning. And um, you can see that um, the majority of them believe that AI will attain superhuman intelligence by the 2060s. Another, that's just intelligence, okay? Well, you can attain superhuman intelligence without being a bad actor, uh, but many think that no, bad action is also likely to follow, that actual existential risk can follow from that superintelligence. So this, was, this is just an excerpt too of a survey that was done of various experts in the field to gauge their estimates for existential risk from AI. And you can see that the numbers are not trivial. You have some who believe that there is a five, uh, 30, 20 to 30% chance that uh, the overall value of the future will be drastically less than it could have been as a result of humanity not doing enough technical uh, AI safety, um, that there is a 5% risk of existential catastrophe by 2070 involving power-seeking AI, 
and other five and 10% estimates. And even if these are incorrect, some say it's only a matter of time. If you simply take the exponential compounding of intelligence and Moore's laws, it's mathematically inevitable that AI will rise to this level and mathematically inevitable that there will be existential risks. That's beyond my pay grade, I won't opine, but it does prompt the question of what should be done about that. Do we need regulation? Well, the US took its first steps in that regard when Joe Biden, President Biden, uh, signed uh, his executive order on AI. And uh, I'm running low on time, so I'll just kind of fly through this. But it does require developers of AI systems to share safety test results with the federal government. Um, the statutory basis of that is the Defense Production Act. Um, provide certain safety uh, controls with regard to biological threats, uh, certain guarantees of privacy as regards how federal agencies use data, um, certain protections around discrimination, or I should say empowers the Justice Department to pursue discrimination claims um, based on AI, and certain job market protections as well. But these pale in comparison to the EU's far more um, comprehensive, uh, even the what we just talked about, that's an executive order. It doesn't have the full force of law, but the EU's AI Act does. And it adopts a tripartite risk-based approach that divides AI into three categories, uh, unacceptable risk, uh, high risk, and minimal risk. Unacceptable risk categories include things like, oh, pardon me, include um, things like, uh, AI systems for social scoring or real-time remote biometric identification through facial recognition. And these, those uses are, are outright banned. Uh, your high-risk categories, such as uh, critical infrastructure, educational, uh, employment, essential services, law enforcement, are subject to comprehensive management record keeping, and they must be registered in an EUI database. And then your minimal risk categories, your sort of general purpose AI systems like chat GPT and spam filters and the like, those are simply subject to transparency requirements. Uh, users uh, must be informed that they're interacting with an AI system. So I'm sorry I spoke so fast, but I tried to get through all my material. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Professor Nugent, thank you for your presentation on law and AI. And here's a question for you. Can AI be used to predict case outcomes or assist in legal decision making? I mean, it can. I guess it depends on the nature of the what you're asking. From a capability standpoint, yes. The question is whether what effect or force it should have. Um, for example, there was a case, and I think Professor Ashley will probably know the citation uh, better than I, uh, where... Uh, let's see, they, a judge relied on AI to recommend a sentence, and this was challenged. Uh, pardon me if this was already discussed in the last one. Um, this was challenged as a violation of, um, I don't know, due process or uh, a right to an impartial judge. And the, uh, the appeal, uh, appellate court decided, no, it's acceptable because it was the judge retained final discretion. So I don't foresee a future probably not even an eventual future where AI gets to make the final decision in legal cases, but I think that it will increasingly be relied on to inform legal decisions. Okay, thank you. My second question is, how is AI currently being used in legal industry? That is probably not an area that I am uh, as capable of speaking on. Um, I, I don't work in the legal industry anymore, uh, apart from manufacturing new lawyers. Um, so I, I couldn't tell you. I know that uh, it's certainly being used to write briefs and pleadings and to do legal research. I use it myself for that purpose. Um, one of the challenges there is that AI is a liar and will hallucinate and make up cases. And it seems like every week there's a new story about some lawyer who submits a brief uh, <laughs> to her motion to a court citing a non-existent case. And it's foolish because you should check all these things. I mean, back in the day when I was practicing law, I would 
uh, rely on treatises and uh, searches on on Westlaw and Lexis to get uh, cases to support my points. And I would add the citations and I put them together in, a, in, a, in my brief. I would send it out to my colleagues for review. And then in parallel, I would go and I'd read the cases because just because a snippet is there in a nice treatise or that Lexis has provided it doesn't mean that it's good or it might even the case might the snippet might be correct, but the, the overall thrust or holding of the case is actually not helpful for your for your case. And so um, it's a real dereliction of duty to not review every, any case that you cite. Uh, so how is it being used in industry? That's my impression of how it's being used in industry, and it's being used poorly. Thank you. Here's a question for Professor Ashley and Professor Nugent. What's your solution to handle all these AI negatives? Professor Ashley, would you like to answer it? Um, well, uh, on a small scale, uh, I think it's a matter of educating uh, law students, or at least that's what I'm engaged in. Uh, so we have a, a course um, I'm teaching this semester on uh, applied analytics and AI. I have about 20 law students and a couple of uh, computer science uh, students as well. And um, basically, we are um, teaching them uh, uh, how to use the technology, but also focusing on the limitations of the technology and the ways in which they can evaluate the uh, uh, technology and its limitations. Uh, and I think that kind of um, uh, training is going to be key uh, uh, so that they can see what what utility these tools have, but also not be taken in uh, by the commercial uh, representations about the tools. Uh, so th that would be my small scale answer. I would agree with that. Um, as for the, the, the sort of broader question of how do we handle these AI risks in the law in general, I don't think there's any way to answer that uh, succinctly. I think it's it's, it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. I think we're going to be, I mean, we encountered the same issue when the internet appeared on the scene, you know, 30, 35 years ago. How do we handle the kind of action at the distance that the internet enabled? How do we handle jurisdiction? Uh, I didn't even get into that. Uh, when you have a, a website that's theoretically accessible over the entire planet, um, you know, you're just someone in your basement who has some, uh, a mail delivery business and suddenly you're subject to jurisdiction everywhere. These are problems that the uh, the law needed to figure out uh, early on. I think we'll just be figuring this stuff out for the next 20, 30, 40 years in a very piecemeal fashion, making lots of mistakes along the way and hopefully some correct decisions as well. Thank you. For our last question, should we regulate how researchers do research on AI? Uh, well, as a researcher in AI, I certainly hope that isn't going to be the case. And I hope to, re if, if it is going to be the case, I, I hope I retire before it happens. <laughs> I, I generally don't think so. Um, but it does raise interesting issues. I mean, we do regulate. Well, I guess it depends. I mean, I can do as much research as I want on nuclear technology. Um, but if I'm not handling nuclear technology, then that's not a concern. Uh, likewise, I can do as much in, uh, research as I want on, on uh, you know, engineered viruses. But if I'm not handling engineered viruses, then that's not a concern. AI is tricky because anybody can start researching AI and spinning it up and modifying it, creating it in their basement. Um, I tend to think that it would be too difficult uh, maybe impossible, maybe unconstitutional to regulate. There's, there's a famous case, the name has escaped me at the moment, but um, basically a famous case that code is law, or sorry, no, that's that's uh, that's a famous statement by um, Larry Lex that um, code is speech. Um, you know, you can't, this, this, this came up in the past with regard to export controls. We can't, you know, there are laws restricting what kind of technology can be exported abroad, but if uh, technology is, sort of instantiated as, as mere code, as source code. Can you post that on a blog and describe that? Can you put, post it on GitHub? Is that an export? And the law is, is at least in the United States, we have grave limitations on, on ability to regulate information per se. The problem is that 
AI is essentially information. It's the combination of code and training data. Now, one thing that makes it a little bit more tractable, although there are uh, objections to this, is that to do AI at scale, you need massive infrastructure. Um, AI is not profitable at the moment because it requires thousands, uh, millions perhaps, of GPU cores. Um, Microsoft has poured billions into OpenAI, and um, that's mostly uh, as a result, sorry, it's, it's part equity, but a great deal of it is just providing the infrastructure, the raw number of virtual machines used to train that AI. So that does make it a little bit more like nuclear tech and a little bit more like bio uh, agents, but I've also heard reports lately that that's going to increasingly be less the case, that we will be able to, using 5,000 hour laptops, create capabilities comparable to GPT 3.5 or even 4. So it's a long way of saying, I don't think we'd be able to. And even if we were, there would be, I think, very significant constitutional issues to wrestle with. I also wanted to point out that, uh, at least in the university setting, where one is doing uh, research with AI, um, sometimes one wants to evaluate the AI systems uh, uh, and involve human subjects in the experimentation uh, as users of the AI systems. And of course, a university researchers are subject to ethical considerations that are fairly rigorously enforced in the university setting. Uh, so one has to go to the internet, uh, to the uh, IRB, the review board, and get and explain carefully what one wants to do and get their permission to do it. So there is some level of of uh, ethical regulation, if you will, of AI research. Okay, thank you. Um, for our final question, how should we educate the public the benefits and risks of AI? in order to improving well-being and migrating risks in the meantime from legal perspective? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I so, join you there, yeah. Nick. <laughs> it's such a big topic. I, I don't, I, it's maybe um, overdetermined for me to, to formulate a, a comprehensive answer to that. And, um, you know, not that you're asked, not that you're, saying that um asking us to prescribe something by law but i think you know it's just going to be a thousand ships launching and many of them are going to sink and some of them are going to be helpful and some some resources are going to be informative and uh that's why everybody we know is teaching or researching in ai in some fashion these days i, I think that the uh, european perspective probably is different because uh I imagine that the uh, passage of that uh, AI regulatory uh, law is is something that is uh, very widely publicized, and and people will start to to realize uh, uh, what limitations uh, and what rights they have, and what limitations there are on the uh, on the providers of the systems. So that's probably one way to do it. And in this country, we don't have that kind of ext extensive regulation, not yet anyway, but at least at the state level, um, it, uh, we're starting to see some examples of, of legislation like that. All right. Thank you again for your phenomenal presentation. Thank you all for joining us today via Zoom and YouTube. I hope to see you again on our next webinar. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye.